All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is episode number 111 at the BS Machine and super excited for this um, this episode. I've got a really cool guest on. His name's Luke McLean and uh, he's a coach and a meditation teacher and he's also got a, uh, a really cool podcast, the Luke McLean Life, I think it's called, the Luke McLean Life Podcast. And one of the things I can't wait to talk to Luke about is um, his transition in uh in life he's um he was in corporate and uh sort of like a high flyer and then he just picked up the fam bam and went over to tassie and now he lives in now lives in like the forests and he's just like (laughs) rocking it with with nature and it's such a cool transition and i think a lot of people (coughs) excuse me by the way i didn't put the podcast out last week because of how i sound i got fucking nailed last week with a head cold but um but yeah, Luke McLean, welcome to the potty, brother. Thanks, Tommy. It's good to be here, mate. So yeah, looking forward to having a chat and um, yeah, getting into it. Love it, man. And dude, one of the things that I, uh, from our, uh, we've chatted a little bit. Well, one of the things I love about you as well is you work with a, a lot of men as well, which I absolutely love and, and we need more of. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Like, you know, from my time, you know, looking after wellness at, at Cotton On and, and doing a lot of work with a lot of the execs there, you know, a lot of you know, a lot of men, especially in those 40s to 50s, uh, you know, they're in a really important time of their lives where often we're parents, we've got leadership management roles, there's a lot of stress and there's a lot of responsibility. And instead of moving away from our wellness, we need to move closer into it to, mm. to deal and cope and be at our best for those times. Um, so, you know, that's the work that I sort of do and and trying to help a lot of the men sort of establish wellness as a, as a value, as something that they hold central to performance, to relationships. And, you know, we we value what we prioritise. And when we can start to prioritise our wellness, we'll value it more and we'll start to embed it and create systems and the boundaries we need to, to bring it into our lives. So it's sort of that, that starting point, Tommy, that I try to work with men on and then how we go about that, which could be a, a program like yours. Um, it could be running, it could be whatever. Everyone's journey and that's going to be different. But the starting point is that we sort of need to to see it as a, a performance tool, as a way for performance, a way for relationships and almost as a way of life. And the second part I look at it too, mate, is like as we get older in our 60s, 70s and 80s, the investment we make in our 40s and 50s is going to hold us in good stead. So I almost call it like super for our wellness. You know, if we do the work now, we're not get, we're going to be in much better shape later on as opposed to sort of you know having our life at the cost of our wellness um that's going to cost us both physically and financially later on absolutely and look tell us a little bit about where you where you sort of come from because you were working a lot of people have if you haven't heard of cotton on you probably don't live in australia but luke was uh you know quite high up in the in the in that uh, is was it the HR team or at uh, Cotton On or what were you doing? I don't know, mate. It was you know I don't know what team I was in, but yeah. So I got uh, given the job as I think it was the first PT initially at the group. You know, in the, this little space, and it was you know five hundred people at the time. But mate, what I got is I got to train. Um, there was ten execs at the time, including Nige Austin, who owns the company. You know, really ripping bloke and. So I got to spend, you know, two to three hours a week with these 10 execs, you know, helping those guys and and women. And, you know, that started. And then what we did is we, we built classes off the back of that. And then we built really sustainable but cheap PT um, and created this really big wellness space that went to sort of boot camps and yoga and retreats and that's all sorts of stuff. And then it was a global program. But, Tommy, like the biggest thing I learned, mate, is like when you get to spend, you know, 30 hours a week with executives and then guys that are really hype in leadership you learn a lot about leadership as well but also understanding how important holistic wellness is to their life not just being physically in shape but mentally being present and you know creating things like boundaries and how important that is to their lives and, and to our lives as performance especially the higher you get up the more you've got to manage it well mm. and so have you been one of those lucky fuckers that is always like but go, like always been quite healthy or where, where have you sort of come from? Cause you know, those, yeah, I, I remember um, I had this mate back and I still sort of know him here and there, but um, he was a, one of the footy players uh, back in the day. Uh, do you remember Spriggsy? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but, um, da- David Spriggs. David Spriggs. Yeah. Yeah. He used to roll around with him back in the day. And mate, 
We used to go out, smash it on the beers and just have massive nights. And this guy was just up rocking it, always fit, always looked like a million bucks. And there's those people that just have that thing. Um, and so, I mean, have you come from a place where you just always held uh, health and, and whatever at high levels for yourself and, no. and just been able to do that? Or what, what, what's your no. sort of... No. Um, mate, I was an obese kid, like a really obese kid, you know, and my parents had no no knowledge of wellness at all. So I could just eat, we just ate crap as kids. Yeah. And I remember, mate, like halfway through grade six, my parents divorced, um, split up, and I got moved to another school, which was this super healthy school, you know, in Ocean Grove, Ocean Grove Primary. And I get there and I'm the fattest kid in the school. So when you're in halfway through grade six and you go to a new school, mm. but then you're the fattest kid who's in the school now. Wow. Um, that was sort of a real eye-opener. And I was... You know, I was a decent footballer. Even though I was a big kid, I, I loved footy. And I well, can wait, remember- can, when can you just so I can get a visual, like were you like proper fatty? Like, you know, when you see those kids and you're like, fuck, this kid must eat a lot of donuts. Was it one of those or were you just a bit overweight or where, where were you at? No, nah, I was proper, proper fat. The donut kid. Yeah. 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 So proper big to the point, mate, where so – the first game of footy, the school footy that, you know, and I didn't know back, back in my old school, there was other kids as big as me. So I sort of, you know, the perception wasn't there, mm. but coming here, it was obvious. And that was sort of the, the, you know, aha moment for me. And to the point where I went to play the first game of footy and they couldn't find a jumper big enough for me. So they had to borrow one from the local footy club from the under 15s so I could play. So, you know, even now at 42, mate, you still remember those moments of how impactful they were. So that was sort of me to go, listen, I valued my sport. I want to get in shape. So what I did is I just asked mum to go and buy, I had, like this is back early nineties, go and buy some muscle mags. And what are those guys? Eat? Cause those guys look good. So I just read, you know, chicken breast, veggies, you know, no sugar. So I started to, you know, at 11, 11 and a half, change my diet for the better Wow. Um, and that was sort of, you know, we, we, mate, we changed for two reasons, wisdom or pain. And that was pain. Mm. You know, I didn't want to be the fat kid mm. in the town. Um, you know, you sort of come into a point of grade six, year seven, there's girls. This isn't where I want to be in life. So that was enough pain to to move me forward. Wow. that's in, that, Dude, that's impressive doing that at 12 or 11 or 12 years yeah. old. But, yeah, you, you must have been experiencing quite a bit of like a lot of pain. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of pain and a lot of motivation, like, because, you know, like music was for you, Tommy, I think sport was for me. So mm. I wanted to be decent at sport and I was very driven. Um, and, you know, you sort of know, you watch the cricketers, you watch the footballers, none of these guys are hugely obese, you know. So I knew that's something I wanted to do. So, yeah. And, yeah, I just didn't want to be that kid. Yeah, yeah. And then so from there, you you sort of got into the footy and, and did you, how'd you go at footy? Did you do all right? I was okay. Like I was a good local player. That was sort of my thing, mate. Um, it's just a lot of now knowing it, you reflect back. I'd be like the music. There's a lot of ego attached to yeah, to the yeah. football, and there's so many insecurities in men at their footy. Mm. You know, in terms of their whole status and identity is based on how well they play, um, what type of girl they date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, which is mm. really a shallow way to live. And this is why I think also a lot of the footballers, you know in all levels, experience mental health because they're not grounded in something more meaningful. But I also think it's a really good platform for sport, for movement, for community as well. So I think done right, it can be really, really great. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, and then you became a PT, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Which was, yeah, mate, it was, I was working with my dad and he was building fences, which was good. I didn't mind that, but it wasn't my thing. We just um we just won the you know the ballerine footy grand final. It was a Sunday. I was hungover as like you know really bad Monday mad Monday on it again, and then Tuesday again, and then it came Wednesday, and I could remember being in bed, and the bus came past my house to go to the races on the Wednesday to celebrate again, and I couldn't I couldn't drink anymore. I was done. 
So I just didn't answer the door. And that night was the first night where a mate of mine um, who ran face-to-face fitness, who did, you know, PT, I just basically rang him and said, mate, can I join? And I, that night I went to the first to become a PT. I just went to my first thing. It took me six months to become qualified. But sort of one thing I reckon, Tommy, is if finding if you want to find purpose, go back to what you love to do as a kid. Mm. You know, I love sport. So I thought, well, PT could be something that I'd really enjoy. Um, and that one, again, that one decision to go on that Wednesday night led to a, a career which has, you know, changed my life. Unbelievable, man. And well, not just your life, you've changed a shit ton of other people's lives as well. Yeah. 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 So yeah. it's awesome, mate. It's awesome. I love it. Um, and you know, that sort of moved into I guess a discovery of what's 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 health and wellness really. And we could, you know, you'd know, mate. You could look awesome. You know, you see these girls and guys with six packs, they're so fit, you know, and you, you'd think that they're they're healthy. But if you haven't got mental health as well, if you're unhappy, if you're you know anxious, if you're really struggling with that mental side, are you truly healthy? Are you better to be a few kilos overweight, um, but more content and happy with who you are, more grounded in the moment than being elite looking, but, you know, really anxious, really judgmental, et cetera, et cetera, which led me into that mindfulness and meditation space to sort of look at holistic health. And so with with the meditation part of it, do you, how did you fall into that? How did you discover uh, meditation and, you know, different aspects of mindfulness? Because what you do now is uh, if you follow Luke's um, Instagram, you'll see that he, uh, mate, this guy literally wakes up at 4 a.m. and just goes and runs through forests in Tasmania. It's so cool. So, but then you you have these little aha moments and you stop and you share it on Instagram. And um, and I really love that how the, you know, what you're talking about is combining these two aspects of mindfulness, but using the body as a physical vehicle to, you know, to spark something up in your in your spiritual self or in yourself. And, and that it's, a, it's a good combo. Cause it's, that's, that's why, I mean, the way that I look at it, I just use when I'm at my peak, I know that I'm using my body in order to peek through into what's really possible in my, my ether or in my spiritual self, you know? Mm. So, um, so what, what, how did it sort of happen with the, that whole transition to the mindfulness game as well. Yeah, mate, for me, mindfulness, I, I guess I discovered that I reckon 2010, you know, maybe, yeah, sort of 12, 13 years ago, um, you know, and sort of got into it by looking at a lot of the execs that I worked with who were stressed, you know, and really struggling with that. And then, you know, understanding a bit more about mindfulness and about, you know, training the mind and, and sort of understood that that's a really important tool. And I sort of, I took the, took it, Tommy, as like we train the body physically to get in shape. We train it for different things. You know, if we want to be more aerobic or more flexible, we'll do different different aspects. And training the mind is no different. And for thousands of years, you know, all cultures, all religions have had an element of mindfulness training, you know, um, and meditation to build a deeper connection to self. This self-understanding, once we understand understand the self, we can then be self-aware, then we can regulate. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, so, yeah, so the meditation sort of came in from that perspective as a way of just training the mind as well as training the body. The trail running for me is my version in many ways. I'll still sit there and do some breath work whilst running, but, you know, trail running for me is a great, a great avenue as you have to be present where you have to be where your feet are because you're going through trails. You've got to be mindful. You can't just switch off. You've got to be knowing where they are. You get to take in sounds and sights. You get to listen to animals. There's just a lot there. And again, every religion um, through time has used pilgrimages as a way of enlight of a way of enlightenment, you know, long walks, um, you know, challenges to overcome have been a way to grow, you know, and that's through Christianity, through Buddhism, you know, long walking, no cars. This is how people really went on those journeys. So for me, the the longer runs are a way of doing that, you know, in the mornings of, of that self, self, self understanding and self-awareness. And, and when we're talking longer runs, I mean, what are we talking? 
Oh, mate, for me, oh, anywhere from eight to 45 Ks in a run will do. You know, I average, I think, you know, anywhere from 80 to 100 Ks a week if I'm sort of Shit. not, yeah, not training. And if I've got a, a race coming up, you know, I'll, I'll bang out a bit more than that. But it's like yoga for you, mate. Like you just, the body, be, the body's a, an amazing tool that becomes accustomed to it. So, you know, I get out there, 15 Ks feels like a, a scroll. Like it's really like, it's just like, that's just the average. And then you sort of get up to 30 and then you're starting to work a little bit for it. It'd be like you jumping on the mat for 25s and nothing. Yeah. 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 Man, that is incredible. So now where you live now, you live in basically what, like an hour, the hour out of Hobart or something, is it? Like what's the place where you're living now? So we're in a little place called Jeeveston, which is the second most southern town in, basically in the world, you know. So that's, you know, we're about an hour from Hobart. Um, and if you sort of go another hour, our way, you sort of will get down to Cockle Creek, which is the most southern place, you know, apart from, um, you know, south, south. So, yeah, that's where we live, mate. I live in a little – we live in a little farm and out the back, again, is literally hundreds of kilometres of logging trails and different trails. So – you know, I can go out there, literally run for, you know, six months and won't see anyone. I don't, I won't, there's no one in my area. I pat a horse on the way down that I see every morning, you know, give him an apple or, and then I'm gone and I'll come back when I come back. And yeah. And you're cool. up at 4 a.m. Yeah. Generally four. Yeah, yeah. Anywhere from four to 4.30, mate. And that's without an alarm clock. That's me just waking up sort of naturally. I don't send anything, but one of the biggest things with that time is I've got five kids, mate, and from seven o'clock we don't have any TV on at all ever. So we play cards every night. Our whole, you know, basically our whole family play either Monopoly, we'll play Uno, or we'll play like Memory or or cards. Um, so there's no TV. So by the time eight thirty nine o'clock hits, everyone's tired. You know, yeah. we've got a, a blue light on in the corner. It's dark. We try and get in touch with the circadian rhythms and that's sort of how we've lived for probably the last 12 months. And it's a game changer, mate. It's a game changer because the kids don't know any different now. Mm. It's like it's card time. We do, you know, Saturday nights we watch a movie together, but we'll put that movie on 6.30 and it'll be finished by 8.30. So, yeah, it's 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 just what I do. It's what we do. And, yeah, it's pretty cool. Mate, it does sound pretty cool, to be honest. And but but obviously you uh you so you lived in you were in Melbourne right you were living in Melbourne and you know you were PT you were just amongst it all and what, what was there a part of you that was chasing a, a dream but then you sort of realised that that's not your dream at all or how did this whole thing happen where you go from Melbourne the hustle and bustle PT cotton on all this type of stuff and then you're like oh let's go to a farm in the most southern parts of the world? Yeah, it was a transition, mate. We started in – I was in, I was in Melbourne. I was always in Geelong, which is a bit less. Yeah. Um, but we moved – from there, we moved out to a little place called Birigara, which is near Lawn, which is, again, similar – not similar to here a little bit more. And I was commuting into Cotton On to do that work because I always loved nature um, more <laughs> so, mate. So that was, for me, that that – that drive but what we did mate was you know sort of the start of this pandemic thing is we just wanted to get out of Vic um sold the house with no real plan no security bought a caravan um and thought let's go and travel Taz for six months and just see what happens and you know that's a pretty big thing when you've got five kids you've got you know we talk about you know the financial responsibilities but also you've got to trust dude how so, do you have five kids like, oh, mate. How does it yeah. work? Like, would you, you'd probably, because think, because we're, me and my girl are pregnant now. We're at 23 weeks, but we're like, I oh, will have one and I don't know, we'll just see how we go. But I'm going, how does someone have like three kids and go, oh, do we go again? <laughs> like, or does it just happen? Or is it just like you leave it up to nature? Or what, what's the thinking behind having five kids? That's unbelievable. It's so cool. Yeah, I don't know, mate. It I'm a pretty relaxed guy, so it's sort of you do what whatever happens happens. Yeah. Um, so that was sort of the mindset, um, a little bit with it. I think the mindfulness practice, mate, was probably a bit to blame because 
quite able to deal with the three was quite easy. It's like four shouldn't be too bad. Let's do five. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, you know, traveling for six months in a caravan with five kids, there's, that's a different level of sort of connectedness that we sort of really appreciated. That's like full, that's a yeah. pilgrimage. Yeah, that was. So that was good. But um, again, you sort of forward view, mate, and want to go, well, when the kids are 25, what are they going to remember? And hopefully they'll remember that trip, you know, of, of walking Wine Glass Bay together, of, you know, being on Brinny Island for Easter and watching the fireworks, things like that, that, you know, other families, you know, we want to use other, and no judgment on whoever does it, but we want to use nature as the playground or the experience that the kids grow up in. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of been our philosophy of that's probably, especially the way we live these days, that's not a bad way to grow up still. And it might be a bit extreme for some families, but then I look at other families and I'm like, you guys are well too far the other way. Like mm -hmm. you've got, you know, having 15 devices in your house and having your kid gaming for eight, nine hours a day, that for me is too far the other way. I'd rather be too far this way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of, you know, you might find some middle ground, but yeah, that's where we're at. Yeah. And and so can you give us a bit of insight uh, into when you wake up? Because you've probably taken most of this for granted now, but um, well, no, I'll, that's a total assumption, but I'm just, because you live in it, you know, but what, it'd be so cool to hear when you walk out, of your place, you're living on a farm, like literally no one around. You walk out at four, you know, four thirty in the morning to go walk down towards that horse and give him an apple and whatever. Mm. Um, what what's the fear, what's it like to be there with literally nothing around? Yeah, you get up, mate. Have a coffee. Um, I'll do a little bit of breath work and meditation and then I'll, you know, chuck the runners on to get out. Oh, it's, it's incredible. Like I know how lucky I am. Like I literally surrounded in mountains. Um, sometimes in the, in the winter, you know, I'll get out in the trails a little bit later, maybe five quarter past five, but it's for the first hour and a bit, it's completely dark. Um, so I'm running with a head torch on and that's cool. You know, that's really, really nice. And then you watch the sun rise and then the, the day changes and you get to welcome the day in. And that's just, for me, that's that's where I want to be. That's how I want to live. Um, and, you know, everyone's got their their thing. Um, but I don't need much else, mate. Like, not much else. And that's sort of, that's what I do. And it's, yeah, it's incredible. So with the with the work that you're doing, uh, you're a meditation teacher, and you've got uh, you do coaching like mindfulness coaching as well. Uh, tell us what you're what you're what you're doing with that, because it'll be good to hear your insights um, from the the place that you get to view the world from, mm. uh, being where you are, and and also you know coaching people through especially, you know, whether it's up because so, most of your clients are men, correct? Mm. Yeah, mate. So, um, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I've done this for a fair while now. And, mate, for me, especially in the mindfulness wellness space, and it might sound a bit like men are like, I don't need, I don't need coaching. Like, what, what, like what's this coaching I don't need? And it's like, well, if you feel like you're not present, you're not available, you're not engaged at either at work or with your kids. Um, if you look in the mirror and, you know, there's an element of you're not happy with your body or you just don't have the energy that you want and you're getting home and you're needing 10 beers to fall asleep. If there's these things happening, there's an opportunity for you. But what, what a lot of people don't do, mate, is, and this is men and women in general, is they don't start with building the foundation, the strategy and the framework of, of their wellness. It'd be like trying to start a business without a vision, a strategy, and some values. You're not going to go far. And a lot of people don't want to do that, that, that foundational work to actually build out. And I call it the VIPs, mate. What are your values? And then how are you going to live from those four? You know, usually it's four values and how are you going to live from them? We want to start to build the identity of the person you want to be that's living those values. So not just I want to lose 10 kilos, 
I want to be a, a fitter, healthier, more more present dad. That's the identity I want to start to embody. P's doing it with purpose and what are the practices and S is the story. What's the stories I'm going to tell that are going to move me forward? So we start to look at the VIPs and then we start to build out an actual framework, strategy and a plan for how you're going to do this. And, and why I do this with men is because how many men have tried yoga, bought new running shoes, been to the gym and eight weeks later, they're back on the couch and they've failed. And it's because they haven't got the right strategy or framework behind them to actually change. So if you can go and buy it, buy, go and buy another gym membership and go and buy 10 more sessions of yoga. But if you haven't done the actual foundational work to understand, to create that change and build your strategy, your values and do that, that work, chances are you're in your forties, you're going to fail again because the other 10 times haven't worked. So why would this one be different? So I want to start to work with the guys to actually start to build the, the foundation and the framework for who you are, who you want to become, and then look at the steps needed to take action to sustain it. So in 60s, 70s, that 30-minute run or that Tuesday night yoga session, that's a non-negotiable. That just happens because that's part of who I am. Mm. So that's the work that I sort of I start to do with men. It's more the, the foundational work. So when they jump into a program like yours, Tommy, they're going to continue on and, and see those changes come along rather than just buy it on a whim do it for six weeks and then two years later, like I, I used to do yoga. I did it once. Mm. Like, Why did it drop off? Oh, a life got busy. Mm. Well, life mm. doesn't get busy. You just get really crap at boundaries. Mm. That's what happens. So we've got to actually look at the boundaries you want to create, what you're saying yes to. Um, Greg McCowan, he's got a podcast. And, and, you know, one of the best things I listened from that podcast is when we say yes to something, we say no to something else. So if you say yes to Netflix, you say no to stretching. If you say yes to 10 beers at 11 o'clock at night, that's fine. You say no to the run in the morning. And that's that's the, the, the awareness to know, well, what am I saying yes to? Then what am I saying no to? And do I want to shift some of those yeses to no's and no's to yeses based on my values and the person I want to become? Mm. And we start to look through that and we start to look at it more like a business strategy as opposed to just jumping in and having a crack. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? There's on, on the no's and yeses, there's uh I listened to this book. I don't know if you've heard it. The um it's a book by Chris Voss. Um, it's the basically this Chris Voss guy was like a FBI negotiator. And he was he was sort of talking about the the a similar thing, but the opposite. Mm-hmm. He's like, because when you say no, people when, when people say no to something, it's actually they feel more empowered, right? So in a negotiation technique, he's saying you want to bring people to say more no, not yes. Yeah. And um, so, for example, let's say if I, um, you know, let, let's say there's someone that you or I want to get on our podcast, right? And um, and they're, you know, they're, they're fucking huge. And it's like, hey, man, would you want to come on my podcast? And it's like, you know, you're probably not going to go say get anything, or or maybe get a yes, but you, I don't know. You know, but if you if you ask a question by saying, "Hey, Luke, would it be ridiculous for me to ask you to come on my podcast?" No, 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 that's not ridiculous at all. You know, so yeah, it's like, I, and I've used that some of my for, for myself. You know, to say to myself, Tommy, would it be ridiculous? for you to go out there now and just do 10 minutes of breath work mm. or would it be ridiculous for you just to fucking go out there and get in the fucking cold shower this morning? And I just go, no, let's just fucking get it done. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's a, it's a similar thing, but it's a different ways of getting well, to the mindset. Yeah. And it's a bit, Tommy, like there's, that reminds me of this, you know, when I coach and work with people, like sometimes the, like imagine if, imagine if you were getting up at four in the morning, right. Or imagine like, the, the more powerful question in exactly what you're saying, what if you don't? Mm. So what if you don't stop? You know, what if you don't stop drinking six beers every night? Right? What if you don't change your eating habits and you continue to eat the way you're eating? What if you don't do anything? What are you going to look like in 10 years' time? Mm. And that's a more powerful question. And what if you don't? Because it's like if you continue on doing what you're doing, what's going to happen? What if you don't change? Mm. Where are you going to be? Yeah. Do people reflect and go, oh, hang on. If I don't do anything, right, I'm going to be burnt out. I'm going to be 
30 kilos overweight, I'm going to be divorced. What, yeah. if I don't, what if I don't stop gambling? Okay, you're going to have no money. You're going to have no kids, no connection. Oh, that's a powerful thing. So, yeah, I agree. You know what, with with men, because, I mean, obviously I work with a lot of men as well, but with uh, with with my coaching clients as well, one of the, the funny thing is the one thing that when you do a little digging – with guys that have got really shit diets and they're drinking a shit ton of beers, like drinking six, 10 beers a night or whatever, one thing that they've all got in common, if you dig a little, is they, they most of them can't get a good fucking hard on. And when you actually get that, get that out of them, that's when they feel the shame. Because, you know, as men, we're like, yeah, I'll fucking root her or, you know, whatever. Or, yeah, I like you want to be that guy that's a stallion in the bedroom. And, you know, it's like your girlfriend just gives you the wink and you're like a fucking, you know, you're straight up, straight away. But it's like when you do a little digging, something, a thing that I find a lot of men have shame over is if their dick just doesn't get as hard anymore. Or, mm. you know, that's that real thing. It's that that real bottom of the masculine nature. It's like, dude, if you can't even get your dick hard, like let's, let's fucking, you know, let, let's, let's create a world where you don't have to worry about that. Mm. You know, th- that's why like Viagra, Cialis, all these type of drugs, they are ridiculous. The, the amount of sales that these guys are getting is next level. And you know what? I've used them before as well, because it's like, that's that that's that thing where you're just like, you know, either you're nervous and your mind's not right or whatever it might be, right? And you're like, you know what? I'll just drop one of these things. And that that was when I was single, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, and then I just went, nah, this is not for me. I can I know how to use my body. This is what I do, and then I don't have an issue. But um, but it's when it's these things that when we find these things with guys that really hit home that's when the change starts to come. Like with you, the the little donut kid at school, mm. it's like, fuck no. Look at all these dudes. They're all healthy. Everyone's around me. And you felt, you felt inferior, you know? And I think that's right, Tommy. And that's, you know, that's a, the, the challenge we also I reckon we got, mate, is, is we're starting to accept and normalize some of these things that aren't so normal. Like it's, it's okay to be 15 kilos overweight. It's all right to spend 10 hours on your phone. You know, it's all, it's, yeah, it's all right not to be able to get a heart on these days because most men are battling with it and Viagra is normal now where it's it's not mm. like it's it's not normal based on the the thousands and thousands of years of men's evolution and remembering that this little moment of time is 0.05% of, of life on this earth and we're just accepting that as normal. It's not. Men in their 40s and 50s 200 years ago were fit and healthy. Right, they did manual work. They worked out nature. They were they were men. Mm. Right, they didn't sit for ten hours in front of a screen. Right, we we weren't going to bed at one o'clock and having five hours sleep. Like this isn't normal based on thousands and thousands of years. We just see it as normal based on the last thirty. You know, that's the bit that everyone doesn't understand. And our bodies aren't coping with it because our bodies are still evolved from that time. That hasn't changed that much in 30 years that it, it likes sugar, it likes late nights, it likes, you know, sitting down all day. Like imagine if you put a tiger in a cage and said, mate, you got to sit there for 10 hours a day and mm. stare at a screen. That's not natural. But we do it to ourselves. We're, we've chosen to walk into this cage and go, actually, this is how I want to live for the next 30 years of my life. I just want to stare at this screen, right? Mm. And I want to sit inside, not be close to nature, and be on a phone, and this is this like literally like a training the monkey with cocaine type stuff. This yeah. is what we've done to ourselves, and we don't realize that we could actually open the door of the cage and walk out. Yeah, yeah, it's fucking scary, man. We're gonna we're gonna make some, and you know what? And and the the that thing of yeah, yeah. No, I'll, I'll get it done tomorrow. It's like it's been a busy week. I'll I'll fucking get it done tomorrow. And and so it's one thing that works for me is just 
chunking things down into tiny, tiny, tiny little actions because we're only saying we'll do it tomorrow because we're going, fuck, I'm going to have to get fit tomorrow. Or I've got, I, I just don't have the capacity. I've got kids running around. I've got the wife complaining about money. You know, I've got a mortgage to fucking pay. And, you know, I've got guys at work that are freaking out. No, no, no. And, and it's like, there's all this stuff going on. But really, at the end of the day, if you're, if you do listen to this, it's like, man, like, would you rather worry about all this stuff and you end up in a hospital with a triple bypass in three, five, three to five years, or just fucking don't take things so seriously. Just look at life with a bit of humor and just go, no, nah, fuck it. I'm going to stop being a fat cunt and I'm just going to get to it and get it done. And enjoy- and that's the thing. Once you're in, you and me both know there is no better feeling, even when you when you when you're just starting the journey, when you know you're working the body, you're taking ownership over the body, your life. Fuck, it feels good. Like you, you're just like, oh my god, this is fucking good. It's good shit. Yeah, and I agree, mate. And it's that that little hump. And if I was going to say to any sort of any anyone here, it's like start small, but start. And mood follows action. So if you're waiting to feel like you want to go for a run, like you want to get on the mat, that day is never coming, right? Because the, the starting point is going to be challenging, mm. but you've got to act. That's where you need that bit of willpower at the start. And then you start to feel the benefits of the body moving. You start to feel the benefits of getting out and seeing the sun in the morning. You start to actually understand it. And then you start to want it because that's the, that's the shift and the change that you'll get. And you'll start to feel better. You'll be more energized and go, actually, I want more of this. You know, you don't know how good it feels to feel good until you start to feel good. Mm. And that's the bit that, that people are sort of starting to miss out. So that would be mine, but you've got to get started 30 minutes in the morning. Just commit to that. Commit to getting up 30 minutes earlier. Well, how do I commit to getting up 30 minutes earlier? We'll get to bed 30 minutes earlier. Right, that's start with your nighttime routine if you want to get a better morning routine. It's all connected. Nothing's in isolation. So you start with that, then you start to look at it. The first few weeks might be challenging, but you commit and work through that, then it starts to become habitual. Just like getting home, 10 beers, being on your phone, that's become habitual. That just becomes what you do. We just got to shift that and shift what you're going to do. Um, A lot of men, I don't know what you see, Tommy, but a lot of men, especially in their 40s and 50s, don't want to be held accountable. Like I'm, I do my thing. I'm a man. I'm responsible for me. I'd get someone like you, like me, get someone who is actually going to have the honest conversation and hold you accountable to what you're doing and help and su- then support you as to why didn't you, right? What, what's been the challenge? What are the hurdles? What's missing? Because you said you're going to get up half an hour earlier this week and you got up once where are you at? What's going on? What are you taking ownership of? Most men, especially when it comes to their wellness, they don't want to have those conversations with anyone and their wives and their mates aren't going to hold them accountable because they don't, you know, they're just not there. You're a grown man. You should be able to do it yourself. Well, you need support. Well, also with mates, it's hard to have mates that keep you accountable because a lot of the time we surround ourselves with people that support our shitty habits, you know, and if you start doing something that's good for you, your mates will probably go, mate, fuck you doing that for? Like, come on. Come. But that's when shit has to shift and you got to pull yourself out of that that um, environment. And that's one, mate, I'd really look at with, if you're a guy, is it starts to look at your community. Community is mm-hmm. really important. But if a lot of your mateships and a lot of your community that you've got is is based on, un, on unhealthy behaviours. So oh, we catch up with mates once a year, we go on a golf trip and we get smashed. Right, that's that's our that's our relationship these days. Well, you need to sort of maybe revisit them and look at <laughs> do you find a few blokes to go and do a yoga session with on a Saturday mm. morning, grab a grab a coffee, right? Because yeah. you're still more, you, you need that mateship, you need that community, but you need to sort of rethink it and reframe it into how do I do it in a more healthy way, as opposed to when I was 18, 19, my mateship was Saturday night benders, just going out, getting amongst it. That's how I got mateship. You can't do that in your 30s, 40s, and 50s forever. You can do that every now and then, but if that's the whole foundation of that mm. mateship, you got to rethink it. Yeah, yeah. Mate, it's so good. I love I love these conversations because they, um, and, and you and me both know, these. if this 
these conversations hit home just with one fucking person, then then we're rocking it. You know, it's it's just yeah. And mate, I I look at it. I, I think the details good, but I also think when we can go to the bigger picture, like I I one thing that drives me is I, I've got my kids, and I'm like when they're 30, 40, you know, when they're grown up, right? I want them to have seen their dad as someone who was really fit and healthy, who really brought it. Like the, my dad, I, I vision of like when I'm in my 70s and 80s, they're telling their kids, your dad used to get up, my, your granddad got up at four and he'd go run, you know, 30, 40, 50 Ks in the trails by himself. Like he was a warrior, right? He'd come home, he'd work out. We did the farm, you know, that's the sort of, that's who your grandpa was. Not, man, he just sat just didn't really very little like that's I, that drives me because we've got to be you know we've got to be the custodians and the elders for our kids so the example we set is what they they're going to become and you know I want my boys to be like me i want them to be fit able in their own way to to get after it to be to be men still mm. Mm. so good luke so if people want to work with you or hit you up or, you know, whatever, find out more about you. What's, uh, I mean, I'll put all the notes in the, in the episode notes, but are you taking on clients at the moment or you, you, what what are you doing? Yeah, I've got a little bit of space for some, for some men, mate. I'm about to in Feb, early March, launch what I call project 40, which that will be my real focus. Project 40 is is really around working with men in their forties and fifties to become fitter, stronger, healthier, more present. And that'll be around, you know, just get coaching those men on that that foundational stuff. So that'll start Feb March, but yeah, pre work now. I'm starting to take some clients on for basically 2023. So if you're looking at 2023 and going, listen, you know, that's a year I actually want to do something. Then yeah, that's what I'm starting to do is take starting to take a few on. I don't work with a whole bunch of clients. I work with a few with depth, get that change, get it sustained, and then move on. Um, so that's sort of my thing, but, uh, mate, yeah, on Instagram, you can, uh, digital message me or project40.com.au. That's the, that's going to be the website where people can sort of hit it up and have a look. Awesome. Luke. Thanks. Heath, man. So good to chat to you about all this epic, uh, epic, epic stuff. It's, it's really cool to, uh, to pick your brain and see what you're doing. And man, I just want to acknowledge you as well for, you know, I reckon some of the things that you've done, uh, like moving over to Tassie with the kids and the family and uh, just having this spacious lifestyle, like it's it's something that I, I genuinely believe a lot of people would love to do and you actually had the nads to go and do it. And, uh, and, and you can really see just by talking to you how much of a, a, a positive impact that's just sort of, makes for a family it makes for you and you just you're very clear and um and i i love hearing your wisdom man so it was a real honor to have you on no thank you mate thanks tommy and you know and mate, like parting words is it's one life mate we get one crack at this you know um and that's it like and as much as that could be cliche bloody hell like if you've got something you want to do do it like mm. that's my advice for anyone like don't let fear or worry stand in the way because you know they're great teachers but they're a terrible master beautiful way to end thanks lukey for coming on man uh see you guys see you later bye bs machine family (laughs) thanks luke for coming on uh we'll see you next week